Awkward Abroad by Regis Sprocket. This is an excerpt from the Kindle book, Awkward Abroad, that you can find on Amazon.com. Chapter 1. Kansas. Life is a school, but I just want to play hooky. Excerpts from the Diary of William Sprocket. William Sprocket woke in a bright splash of late spring sun and opened a window, letting in the scent of freshly mown grass, garden flowers, and other fragrances drifting across the plains of Kansas. Fort Bender was a boring town, he thought, but the spring mornings there always seemed vibrant and pure, like Sundays before church. Decades ago, when his teetotaler parents roused him from sleep to a greasy breakfast in the former dry town of St. John. No one ever had a hangover there, and William couldn't allow himself to have one weekdays now, because he had face a series of adolescent monsters with his teacher's edition of Discover World Literature and a stack of corrected but never to be read, student papers. Not that he didn't need a boring town. It was a, a matter of perspective. One could make of this place what wanted to. It provided a low vibration stage for his life's dramas, a gentle progression through the phases of his current existence in time and space, his soul's journey through the cosmos. Maybe at this point in this life, he didn't see it that way, as his spirit was pregnant with fancy and dreams of a better place to be. Had failure or his own mediocrity stifled his enthusiasm for this hamlet on the plains? There was no judge hovering critically over his daily endeavors, no one to say whether he were a loser or not. He could have easily fit comfortably into its routine and just gotten married and achieved a modicum of domestic bliss that was nearly guaranteed by the former pastor Stevens' homespun wisdom and biblical exhortation. Nevertheless, there was an itch in his heart, a desire to stretch beyond the secure comfort across the border of complacency, Suffer a little sublime pain, hit the bullseye of life's enchantments, scratch the dome of the firmament, yet sail wispily down back to earth and start again with clear vision. In any case, these mornings were okay. He only had to endure six hours of teaching and then he could escape to his place on Fort Street and his VCR or go to the taco shop with his colleagues and enjoy a few beers and tacos. During the week, he could go on automatic pilot and forget about his insipid future. All was comfortable routine. If he had felt at least some meaning or direction in life, he would be fine. He just really couldn't say there existed any uh, social chafing, superficially, or irritation on a more profound level with the majority of his community contacts. Fort Bender actually was full of genuinely friendly people, and daily life could be a breeze, if one focused on that freely flowing realm without the prejudice of well-read aspiration. And perhaps his own blunted psychological mechanisms and laziness blighted a healthy field, a reliable crop, a certain harvest. Weekend mornings, when he woke with a hangover, which one could sell to the medical journals, were hell. Then he had to reevaluate his life, agonizing over each new fork in the road of decisions and trying to pull his way out of confusion and lethargy. Coughing, he would tap a new seam of phlegm and juice himself up with a few cups of coffee. For an entire day and part of an exhausting evening, he would feel cast into space, falling and drifting away from emotional security and balance. His worrying and planning seemed to have no firm foundation. He would devote the shaky, drag-ass Saturdays and Sundays to really getting his life in order, only to be interrupted by a call from his mother, full of reminders and advice, some stupid song like Don't Worry, Be Happy on the radio, 
or a Sports Illustrated swimsuit special on cable. Anyway, this was an easy day, relatively free from the burden of introspection. William got dressed, breakfasted on coffee, whole wheat toast, and two Viceroy cigarettes. He had been spending too much on smokes lately. And drove the sedate two miles to Fort Bender High School. Sedate compared to what he had experienced in L.A. on vacation, or his cousin's tales of commuter chaos in New York. He was lucky in that he was not assaulted by a mass of humanity and machine. The town held a caressing veil over his ears. Driving by the houses and dry lawns of his neighborhood and through the downtown area, Smith Hardware since 1889, Rapid Burger, and a handful of practical shops which fulfilled the requirements of small-town life. This created a respite in time when he received those momentary flashes of intuition, and when he wrote down and shared these with his colleagues, and later over a beer and burrito. Two weeks, going to Amsterdam with a gusto. If you try with sincerity, you'll seduce Mary. Eat less, smoke less, drink less, take more risks. Fellow teachers and loyal friends Dick Mayfield and Kate Bloomer would undergo his barrage of neurotic Woody Allen-like bab- babble and comment on his brilliant insights as last week. So, Will, you gonna ask Mary out this Friday? Dick, the ninth grade math teacher, asked. Well, you know she has a boyfriend. I have been trying with her for years. It's always the just friends thing. Besides, I don't think she really likes me. And even if she did, you know, just a little bit, she'd probably say no just because she wouldn't want to hurt me again. I think it's my weight. I'm too plump now, and my hair. I'm getting a bald spot down the center. It's probably not worth it. She's too pretty. You think it'd work? I mean, she's five inches taller than I. She teaches economics. I'm an English teacher. I'm always noticing the pleasurable minutiae of life. Aesthetics. And she, I don't... Oh, shit, Will. Kate, P.E. teacher and one of Fort Bender's only lesbians, protested in her husky voice. You've got to stop this neurotic crap and grab ass. I know for a fact that she broke up with that Helmut Hendrickson one year ago. She's available and ready. Not for anything you'd want to do, Kate, Dick snickered, spitting out a few small chunks of masticated enchilada. Shut up, Dick, Kate shot back. We won't discuss what's been going on with your wife and ex-pastor Stevens. Now will we? Anyway, well, okay, okay. William sipped his butt and tried to reason. Mary is unattached then, but she's really still connected in some way with Helmet. I don't know. Our conversations are so devoid of sweetness, like she doesn't have any real need or desire to relate to me anymore. William's friends sighed and frowned. They had endured his vacillating optimism and pessimism over countless lunch breaks, were resigned to it, and sometimes found perfect solutions to his problems even though their own lives registered an equal level of frustration. All of them were somewhat trapped in this lackluster midwestern town, locked in an early 60s time warp, confused by its stubborn resistance to change. Nevertheless, there was a certain functioning genius in its rhythms. Could life be better somewhere else? That was the mirage some were tempted to see. It was 1993 and the town could create a convincing facade. An outsider from a big city sharing a drink with an overly talkative local might begin to believe that Fort Bender had really accepted contemporary values. The stagnant town, however, remained a bastion of conservatism, a true Bible Bible Belt Center, and a homey, friendly community. But who resided there to criticize it, save miserable loners like William? Was it really so bad? As William saw it, the only question to the status quo, the anomaly that gave necessary titillation to cozy security, was that every month's its gossip network recorded a next-door Prometheus who had brazenly crossed the line of respectability, 
flown too high and stolen too much fire. Did William really care? 